welcome to my talk. I'm Josh Long, the Spring Developer Advocate for Spring Source. Today we're going to talk about a Spring, naturally, Spring 3.1, and I've also got some content related to this, some of the other projects, the ancillary projects besides Spring Core. If you have questions, please feel free to ask as we go. It's quite literally small enough that I could go to each one of your laptops and stare over your shoulders and answer questions. That can be good for us. Um, I've written some books on Spring. Not all of them good, but I do, I do try. Here's two of them. Uh, working on Cloud Foundry in action for Manning right now, and it's actually got a whole bunch of stuff related to the Spring projects. It's about building Spring applications for the cloud. It happens to be tangentially about Cloud Foundry. Uh, between you and me, this is just a little secret since there's only a few of us here, just a handful. Uh, I have written five books, or I'm working on my fifth book now, but I don't know why people buy them. That's the secret. I'm not sure why they buy them. You don't need to. The uh, Spring project documentation has always been very, very good. So if you check out springsource.org, there's lots of uh, uh, great documentation that's second to none. Um, and, and in particular, that Roo book, if you go to springsource.org forward slash Roo, it's free. We give it away. I got O'Reilly to go open source on a book. So yeah. Anyway, that's me. Take down that email. Take down that Twitter handle. If you have questions, complaints, comments, uh, please feel free to reach out to me after the talk. I'm more than happy to answer questions. If you, for some reason, leave this room more confused than when you came in, that's your recourse right there, that, that email, OK? And I'll be happy to give it to you at any point in the presentation. Um, so we're here for very common refrains, right? We're here for very common reasons, which is we're using Spring, and we're using it to solve interesting problems. And the problems that t people typically solve with it are, are many-fold, right? You've got the productivity uh, problems, right? You've got problems that are solved by frameworks and libraries. Um, and then you've got your application that sits on top of that. But uh, very, very saliently, we have a very diverse sort of ecosystem of target platforms today, right? So a lot of people, uh, how many of you have been using Spring? Let me just show of hands. How many of you have been using Spring for five years? OK, so you kind of remember. I mean, I I've been using Spring since it came out. And I can remember hearing these ideal sort of discussions about how Spring could help. Uh, it engendered portability in your applications, right? And so if you're using Spring back in 2003, it meant you could get away from web, the web spheres of the world and get onto lighter, more agile, more uh, scalable little platforms like Tomcat, you know, lightweight application servers. Well, nowadays we're hearing that same sort of migration, that exodus. We're seeing that same sort of thing from application servers in general to more cloudy platforms like, uh, like Cloud Foundry, of course, and other as well. So the, the nature of, our, of applications has changed a lot. The architecture has changed a lot. And having a shim underneath your code, underneath your application that lets you move portably and cleanly to adapt to these different types of architectures uh, is more important than ever, right? Because the cloud doesn't look very much like anything that we had before, whereas Tomcat kind of looked like something we had before. Um, We've also got bigger data, right? How many of you are doing something with big data? No SQL, or not only SQL. Yeah, it's here to stay. We can't ignore it. It's something that's going to be part of what we're doing for the foreseeable future, and for good reason, right? This is a good problem. This is a great problem. We have too much data. Used to be that we couldn't get enough data, right? We, couldn't have, we didn't have enough meaningful insight into the, the data of our application, the data of our users, the data of our domains. Nowadays, it seems like it's coming out of our pores. All we've got to do is collect it. Uh, and dealing with that efficiently and effectively is a very, very big problem, pun intended. So we have environments like Redis and MongoDB that are very, very popular today. Um, we have distributed data caches like Gem How many of you are using Gemfire, EHCache, or Coherence, or you know, something, right? There's, a, there's caches out there right now designed, again, to solve these very sorts of problems. Um, and of course, in that space, there's a spec, JSR 107, which has been dormant, hitherto dormant, since the uh, inception of that JSR like five, six years ago. And it is, an, it is now seeing a resurgence, a new uh, uptake, and they're redeveloping it, or they're reinvesting energy in developing it. And of course, Spring will have support for that, you know. We also have a very wide variety of clients. Do you guys remember when the whole world was, you know, the whole problem that we faced as developers was making things work on Internet Explorer 6 and Netscape 4? in the desktop browser, and that was it. Everything else was sort of, why, why would you care? You know, Who cares about some sort of imaginary tablet that looks like it comes from Star Trek? Who cares about some sort of smartphone that we hadn't seen yet? You know, 
is just Internet Explorer 6 and Netscape 4. Well, things have gotten a lot more painful since then, right? Back, I would kill to have those same problems of just trying to make things work on just those two browsers. Nowadays, you've got to make your application. You've got to expose your application, not just to your, your web browsers, not just to your desktop web browsers, of which there are at least four, right? You've got Safari, Chrome, Firefox, and uh, oh yeah, Internet Explorer. <laughs> um, You've also got these portable sort of form factor devices, these small form factor devices like the tablets and the phones and so on. And all those have their own sort of quirks and compatibility problems. So we're, we're definitely facing a different landscape when it comes to delivery of client technologies. How many of you, just so I know we're not to step, how many of you are using JSF? Come on, admit it. We all tried it once in college. You? You guys? Oh, yeah, good. You know, it's, a, it's, still, it's still out there like the dinosaurs, you know, but eventually some comet's going to come down and we'll see. Um, so, okay, this is the sort of the oldest slide I've ever had. This is my favorite slide. It's been, it's been around, this is the new 2010s version of this slide, but it's still the same slide, basically. I've just happened to have fancy vector gradients now. It's been, it's evolved like I have. You notice that my belt buckle has adopted with the years. Um, this slide has been around since day one. We've had some version of this slide for many years. It describes the three pillars on which the Spring Framework itself is built, right? So we've always said that be, with these three different things, plus good documentation, we can provide solutions. And the, the, the pillars are very important. First of all, you have, of course, dependency injection. The Spring Framework itself provides dependency injection. It's a form of information hiding, right? So at runtime, you don't know about the characteristics of the specific implementation you're using. You build code according to certain baseline, usually interfaces in Java. Uh, and that contract is all that you have to care about. You don't care about what implementation you have at runtime. And that makes it very easy to move your application from test to production to unit testing to et cetera, right? We also try and provide, wherever possible, aspect-oriented programming. Aspect-oriented programming lets you change the behavior of objects declaratively without actually touching the code. This is very powerful, right? Because we can now apply services in a generic fashion to all your objects. So transaction management is a very common example, but logging and auditing and filtering and things like that, right? That's very powerful. So we, we make that available and make that a, a key part of the framework as well. Uh, and then finally, where we can't solve problems using regular dependency injection and POJOs, and where we cannot solve the problem using aspect-oriented programming, we provide libraries objects that you have to compile your code against. So now you have a dependency on the Spring Framework. But wherever possible, we try and make those dependencies as useful as possible, right? So if you're going to use them, we want them to be the most useful thing you could ever imagine using, right? At some point, you're going to have to tie, tie yourself to some sort of API, but let it at least be productive. Let it at least be efficient. Um, and then all those things taken together don't mean anything if there's no good documentation on how to use it, if there's no guidance, right? So the Spring Framework has been, it's always been about good code coupled with good documentation and good uh, dissemination of information. So if you check out springstart.org, there's a lot of resources uh, that'll help you get started, right? Like I said. <sighs> okay, so that's sort of the background. Today we're gonna talk about Spring 3.1. If we have time, we'll look at some of the 2.1 stuff and the Spring Data stuff and Spring Security, but you know, I wholly and completely doubt we'll get there. We'll try though. Um, how, many of you, how many of you have, got, have looked at Spring 3.1 so far, some of the new bits? How, which version of Spring are you guys using? 2.5? 2 2.5? 2.0? 3.0? Okay, 3.0, good. So 3.0 is sort of the, that's starting to become the, the curve, right? It's, there's, a long, there's a long curve between upgrade iterations. So we see a lot of people working on uh, 2.5 and of course now they're steadily migrating to 3.0 and 3.1, of course, now that 3.1 is out. Uh, 3.1 was debut, it was released last November after about a year and a half of beta releases. So it's a very, very well-tested, well-integrated release. And if you have any plans to upgrade, just skip 3 and go to 3.1 because it really is the conceptually complete iteration. It's the one that makes most sense in of itself. It, it feels whole, you know. Uh, there's a lot of new features. There's environment, the environment abstraction and profiles, of course. Java-based configuration, which got a major overhaul in this release. Um, the test framework itself has been adopted to support the Java-based configuration and the environment abstraction. We've introduced a cache abstraction, which is 
one of my personal little favorite features. We've introduced partial, not done yet, but we're still working on it. Uh, we've introduced partial support for Servlet 3, the support that will mean the most for most people anyway. We've introduced that. Uh, we've upgraded the Spring MVC engine to support new features. We added support for JPA and Hibernate 4 and Quartz 2.0 and Java 7. So Java 7 actually debuted last July, I think you guys might remember. Uh, and of course, Spring was released a few months after that, so it was one of the first enterprise, it was, it was the first enterprise technology that was available that had support where appropriate for Java, Java 7 specific features. This is not to say that you need Java 7 to use Spring 3.1, it's just that if it's available at runtime, we detect that and make it, take advantage of it for, for things like the thread pools. <sighs> okay, so as we go through this, I'm gonna work in terms of a little application I built. Um, I hesitate to introduce it now, but just so we have a common background. This is my little Spring 3.1 application. I built it on, uh, it's got a whole bunch of little features, including some of the stuff we're gonna talk about here today. You can get it at github.com forward slash cloud foundry hyphen samples. And it's the uh, Spring MVC Hibernate template, basically. It's just a simple application. Um, I started it up, but I didn't have a time to test it. So cross your fingers. Demo fail, let's see. Okay, good. We need to Spring MVC 3.1. Spring MVC 3.1. Good. Ah, echo loa. So there's that. Good, okay. The application itself is not all that interesting, but you can see it's a very sort of generic uh, database-centric application. Um, we'll go through the code, though. So first things first, the environment abstraction. This is one of those things that was introduced inside of Spring 3.1. It is basically a way to ask, in a programmatic way, the Spring container for information about the environment in which your application is running. So you're gonna ask, you're gonna say, okay, you know, um, I need property files. How many of you have used the property placeholder resolution mechanism inside of the Spring framework? Right, you can parameterize your configuration based on property files. Previously, people have wanted to do things like, well, you know, how can I make that property resolve to dev random? You know, I want entropy in my application. I don't want this to be predictable. Or I want this to come out of JNDI or, you know, I've got a, I've got a rat going crazy in the back lab and he needs to, whenever he runs, I want a new password changed, you know, or something, I don't know. So having that plugability SPI is very important. Um, and that is facilitated through this new environment SPI, these, these abstractions, right? The idea is that you have these beans. You might have one set of beans uh, we, you know, you might have one set of beans that's used in production, another set of beans that's used in test. How many of you guys have cre created different types of uh, bean groupings, different config files, and then you switched out the files based on the environment you're in, right? Very common sort of idiom, very common sort of practice. And this feature codifies that, right? It makes it a uh, first class citizen inside the Spring framework. It, at, in, at pra in practice, it just means that you have an object called the environment object that you can inject, right? And you can ask that object questions like, I need a property, and I want that property resolved against some sort of custom property SPI, property resolution SPI. That's the property resolver interface. So if you plug that in, you can control how properties themselves are resolved. And it also means you can ask, uh, what profile is my Spring context running in? Am I running in test? Am I running in production? Am I running in dev? You know, you can ask questions about that through that environment object. Uh, using the definitions, the profiles themselves looks kind of like this, right? This is what it looks like in the XML. Um, normally you have a, an XML document and then at the top you'll have a beans element and then below that you'll have beans, individual bean definitions. With this new profile support, you can actually nest beans declarations inside of your, your outermost beans tag. So these are actually nested. You can imagine one more beans tag at the top of the document and one more at the bottom, wrapping these two different chunks. Uh, the beans that are inside of the beans declaration are grouped together inside of a profile. So they are only active if that profile is active, right? So you have to say, so you have to tell Spring somehow that I want all the beans that are in my production profile to be active, otherwise, it's as though you didn't register the beans at all, right? They're, they're, they're hidden, they're transparent to the container. Questions on that? Okay. Uh, 
So you can see here we've got a production profile and an embedded profile. Uh, in production, we've got a proper data source pointing to some sort of uh, resource that we've got configured using property placeholder uh, properties. And then for our embedded integration test or unit, or sorry, unit test scenario, we've got a little in-memory embedded database that we spin up and test against, right? So all you got to do when you move this application is switch which profile is active and then the different data source is alive. Notice that both beans, both data sources, produce an object of type data source, javax.sql data source, yeah? We'll get to that. So the question is, how do you trigger the profile? And we'll look at that in just a second. There's a, a few different ways. Um, anyway, the result is that you have two different beans that both produce a type of javax.sql.data source. Just like with regular Spring, if you created two beans of the same type and gave them both the same ID, and you activated both profiles, you would get a conflict, right? You can't have two beans of the same type and ID in, Spring, in regular Spring. It's, it's also true if you activate both profiles at the same time, you'll get a conflict. So, be wary. Um, there is analogous support for profiles using the annotations, right, in the Java configuration. So you can use the at profile annotation on Java configuration classes. We'll look at that in a second. Uh, and you can use that also on individual beans that you annotate. This, I, this approach is probably, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't use the uh, profile beans on individual, be on individual components, right? Better to keep that inside the configuration. But we'll look at it anyway. There's a couple of supported out-of-the-box idioms for so activating profiles. Uh, generically, you can set a system property, so d.spring.profiles.active equals, and then a common delimited list of the profiles that you want to enable. So production, comma, you know, I don't know, data center one or whatever. I mean, you can set up, you can set up whatever you want. Um, this is one way to do it. It's a convenience. The right way to do it is actually to get at a reference to the the application context, a pointer to that application context, and then from there you can get a reference to the environment and then set the active profile programmatically. So if you have some sort of decision that needs to be made before you can activate a profile, you can make that decision, no problem. And in fact, in a web environment uh, where you don't have, you know, in a web environment, Spring boots itself up as part of the servlet, uh, as part of the dispatcher servlet initialization. In that environment, you actually have a callback class that gets run right before the application context is uh, you know, brought into life. And in that, in that scenario, you can actually write your programmatic logic for activating certain profiles and so on before the container starts registering beans. Let's see. OK, so we saw that. Let's see. Let's go through the Java-based configuration, and then we'll look at both of these examples. Um, how many of you guys, some of you said you're using Spring 3.0. Okay. Uh, Spring 3.0 debuted Java-based configuration. Uh, Java-based configuration itself is uh, something that a lot we've had support for in, in a separate project called Spring Java Config. And that was available as a standalone project for many, many years. Now it's available baked into the core of the framework, right? Uh, the idea is that you have XML for de defining beans. And then before, we've had support for scattering annotations on your different classes to have Spring collect, sweep up the beans, and then register them for you, right? Um, but there was kind of a space there still for one other solution, right? A, a, a something that had the best of both worlds. You wanted the static type safety of the Java uh, and annotations, but you also wanted the single resource that you could consult to see the world view of your, all your beans, right? So Java configuration fills that niche. It provides the ability to define all the beans in your, in your application in one place, using Java. We have, in 3.1, introduced support for things that uh, you could do before using XML namespace declarations, right? So for example, in Spring 3.0 and, and before, if you wanted to turn on transaction management, it's as simple as saying TX colon annotation hyphen driven in the XML, right? One little line turns on the feature. Spring has always been, uh, you have to opt in. You have to say, I want this service. I want this behavior. We don't. We don't make a lot of assumptions about how you want your beans to behave at runtime. So we have all these great little features that are one line away. When you turn them on, they apply to the beans that are in your application context, where appropriate, you know, uh, and they provide a lot of features and a lot of functionality, but you still have to turn them on. So one thing that was kind of missing from our original support for Java configuration was an annotation, Java-centric way of turning on these features, right? Once you've turned them on, they're very easy to use. They're just declarative, you know, little annotation-based things. 
Let's see. So we've done that. We've provided these little you know, switches, these little enabling annotations for lots of the things that you would have used XML before, for before, like transaction management and scheduling and the Spring MVC container and so on. So here's an example of a Java configuration class. This is a sort of, you know, very interesting, very plain sort of configuration class. The first thing to notice is that it's a regular Java class that has at configuration at the top. And configuration is a special type of component by the, for the Spring framework, right? When Spring sees at configuration on the class, it treats that like a, an artifact from which it can draw information about your beans. Remember, according to Spring, all your beans are the same thing. At the, same, at the end of the day, when all your beans are managed by the Spring container, it doesn't matter how they got in there, right? It doesn't matter if you used annotations on your component classes. It doesn't matter if you used XML or the Goovy Bean Builder or, or, uh, or namespaces or anything, or Java config, right? They all end up in the same big bag of beans at runtime. So this is just one more way of telling Spring about which objects you want it to manage, right? So we have a configuration class. This is the Java version of an XML file, right? This is not a, a business class itself. This is configuration. When, when Spring sees the at configuration annotation, it'll sift through the class. It'll create the class and then sift through it, looking for all the methods that have at bean on it. When it sees at bean, it's going to invoke the method and then create that bean for, you know, get the, get the returned object and then store that in the context, just like if you had done a bean, bean declaration in the XML. So in this case, we have at bean, public platform transaction manager, TX manager. The ID of the bean in this case is TX manager. It's the name of the method. The type of the bean in this case, the class is platform transaction manager, which Spring can get at runtime based on the return value of the method. And you can see that because it's just a regular method, you can do whatever you want to set it up. There's no, you don't, you're no longer beholden to rules about, you know, one, you have to have a no argument uh, constructor, for example. You know, that stuff, you can do whatever you want. You can initialize the bean however you need to. So you have the ability to use the full power of the Java language inside these methods, construct the object however you want, and then return that and have Spring manage that with the same guarantees it would give any bean that you registered in the XML. Um, you can see here also we have interdependence between beans, right? We've got the platform transaction manager. The platform transaction manager itself depends on the Hibernate, uh, sorry, on the session factory, right? So the session factory is a, a bean that we would specify as a reference in the XML, right? Can you imagine that? A bean, you've got a property and then it says ref and it references the ID of some other bean. In this case, it's to do the same thing, we just call the method, call the method that creates the other bean. And Spring will automatically intercept that call, cache the result, and then configure it, and then return that value once it's been run through the lifecycle promises of the, of the container. So you have the same semantics as if you were using the XML. If you call, that, if you call Session Factory 100 times, you still just get the same object. It doesn't get recreated 100 times. It's just the same cached object that has been given all the lifecycle callbacks and everything, right? With me on this? Okay. Um, let's see. The other thing we've done is that we've, wherever possible, we've introduced cleaner ways of building complex objects, right? In the Spring container, we've historically used factory beans. Factory beans are a way of codifying how to create objects. We've hidden, you know, we've, we've hidden the recipe for creating a complex object inside of a factory bean. That's the, the value of that pattern. Well, now that you're using uh, Java and using just Java config, sometimes it's easier to use more elegant, more uh, succinct approaches like the builder pattern. So here we have a local session factory builder, which you can chain together and then in one line build yourself a Hibernate session factory, right? So we provide those objects where, where appropriate, you know? The other thing to notice, and this is the thing that has changed since the introduction of 3.0, uh, is we've added these annotations to enable some of those features I was talking about. So in this case, I want all the beans in my Spring configuration class to have transaction management applied to it, right? So I've added at enable transaction management on the configuration class. That annotation turns on transaction management for all the other beans in my, con my context. This is the same as if I was using TX colon annotation driven in the XML, right? So you can see here, I, I, I wouldn't need the XML at all. You'll also note that in this case, 
We don't have to specify a transaction manager attribute or an, you know, an, uh, an option for the annotation because it's type safe. So at runtime, we can just pick the platform transaction manager out of the defined beans, right? You don't need the annotation. You don't need to specify it you know, directly. Another big feature, another thing that's gotten a kind of an upgrade is the uh, test support. So we introduced contexts, we introduced profiles, um, and that's only, only useful if you can now test it, right? So the next thing is, okay, when I'm running my unit test, uh, I want to be able to specify which profile is active when I run my tests so that the right beans are active during my tests. So here I have an annotation. I have at active profiles on my unit test. This is just the standard spring test framework, right? The test running framework that we've had since 2.5. Um, where you, sp you specify the context configuration and you specify what kind of test runner you would like, right? So you can, this is a spring mechanism that works for both TestNG and for JUnit4. You're specifying that you want a certain type of application context. In this case, we want an annotation application context. And we're specifying that the application context should look at these configuration classes. Instead of an XML file, we're saying, look at these Java config classes. Right? And then at the bottom, we're saying, I want this profile to be active. Right? So the beans that are defined inside those configuration classes, only if they have an at profile on them that says dev, or if they have no profile annotation on them at all, that's the only, those are the only beans that will be active. Questions on that one? OK. Let's, so let's actually see what that looks like in practice here. We've covered quite a few things already. Can you guys see this in the back? Yeah. yeah. Do those would completely replace the application context of XML? You, no, no. This is in addition to. So you can still use XML. That's not going anywhere. It's very much a very good idea to use it if you want to. Absolutely. Um, and you know, the idea is that it's just a strategy, right? It's just one more way of solving the problem based on your tastes. So if you want to use the class path XML application context, and you want to specify an XML file as the argument for that class path XML application context, more power to you, man. Awesome. Rock on, you know? Um, we just happen to have other ways of doing it now. So you have an annotation config application context that takes as its inputs uh, Java classes. And those Java classes are annotated with add configuration, like we saw. So it's just one more way of telling Spring the metadata that it needs to be able to do the things that it does for you, right? One more input. Let's see. So, so here's a couple, here's a simple, actually, kind of a simple application. The idea is that this is an application that has a data source. Uh, there we go. It's got the same sort of, it's got the same sort of things you'd think, you'd expect most applications to have, right? I have a data source. I have a definition that needs a data source. Um, I'm trying to build a platform transaction manager, which manages transaction management in Spring. It's a, it's the feature that lets you write code in a transactional way agnostic of the underlying transactional resource. So if you're using Hibernate or JTA or JPA or JDO or you know, regular JDBC, it's all wrapped up by the Platform Transaction Manager, SPI. Right? You just specify the right type, and then in your code, you can just say at transactional. At transactional on the methods, and they, get automatically, they, all, they automatically delegate to the correct instance of the Platform Transaction Manager configured in your context. Common thing, just reiterating it for now. The Hibernate Transaction Manager needs a pointer to a session factory. So you can see I'm using Java config here. When I call this guy, session factory, it calls this method over here. And then here, I'm building a, a map for properties. And I'm, then I'm building a local session factory builder and passing in the data source, adding my annotated Hibernate you know, JPA classes, and then building the session factory itself. right? Um, you can see here I've got an injected reference to another class of type data source configuration. Right? So now that I have this ability to use Java, I might as well take advantage of some of the flexibility that it gives me, right? like object orientation and in hierarchies and you know, et cetera. So here I've got an interface. And the interface defines methods that have the objects that I need in my application. Because I intend to run this application in different environments, I need to have that extracted out, right? So I know that I need a working definition for a cache manager. 
I know that I need a working definition for a data source, and I know that I need certain Hibernate-specific properties based on the kind of uh, environment I'm running in. So I've extracted that responsibility out into this little interface. And I've created a couple of different implementations of that interface, right? So here's my local data source implementation based on uh, a profile, right? So it's got at profile local, and it implements data source configuration, and it provides a data source right here using an embedded database, and it provides a local cache manager using a, you know, using a, a regular cache. We'll just look at that in a minute, in-memory cache. And I've got my little uh, Hibernate properties set here to set up the database and so on. So that, that is one version of this interface. Again, I've, I'm, just, I'm just declaring a, a dependency on that interface. It's a configuration class. I expect one of the implementations to be active. I can specify one for development, one for production, et cetera. Um, here's the cloudy version of that same interface. So again, add configuration class, but the profile is now cloud. And I've specified, another, I've specified another type of data source, but this time I'm looking up my data source from the, the, the Cloud Foundry context. I'm actually dynamically creating the data source itself. Instead of creating an in-memory data source, I'm looking it up from some sort of external resource. You might look up the data source from JNDI in production. You might look it up from some other place that's managed. You know, um, I also need a more heavy-duty cache manager. So here I'm actually relying on Redis. This code will only run on, on a cloud, right? It's not going to run locally. Oops. Or at all, if I leave that there. And I've uh, changed the properties here, right? So again, at runtime, based on the active profile, only one implementation of this interface is going to be available. And it'll be injected into my services configuration. And then from there, I can call data source configuration dot contribute session factory properties. I can call data source configuration dot data source. And I can call, um, oh, well, that's it. And then, and then the other thing it does is it contributes a cache manager to the context. So you have all these beans defined conditionally based on the active profile. Um, because I'm relying on certain declarative services like transaction management and like caching, I've got at, at enable caching and at enable transaction management. That turns on these features for the beans in my configuration, right? Okay, questions on that one? Questions on any of that stuff? Okay. Um, a new feature that we have in Spring 3.1, and this one, this one is, you know, probably the least interesting feature ever. I mean, you guys might like it. It's pretty cool. It's nice. It's just so small and adorable. But I give it a slide anyway, because it's awesome. The idea is that you have, uh, you've had historically this P colon namespace, this P colon property namespace. And how many of you have used that, by the way, the P namespace? If you write your typical bean definitions in Spring, you have to say bean class equals whatever, and then you say ID equals you know, foo, and then you have property, and then name equals you know, age, and then value equals whatever, and then property equals whatever, and then et cetera. And so you have these the stanzas of property elements underneath each bean tag. Well, if we're honest with ourselves, uh, that could be more succinctly written uh, as one element with attributes instead of inner elements, right? So instead of saying bean and then property, 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 you can, you can just say bean and then p colon age and then p colon name, et cetera. And you, you say p colon name equals and then you set the value of the, of the property. That's good for properties and you know, a lot of people have used it. It's very elegant. Uh, but there has been a, a clamoring. People have cried murder. They want something bigger and better for constructors. And who can blame them? So with uh, 3.1, we debuted the constructor namespace. The constructor namespace provides the constructor support for what the P namespace did in, inside of uh, previous releases, right? So now, if you have a constructor and you want a way of d using that constructor in line inside your bean definitions, inside the definitions in your XML, you can just use the C namespace, right? Uh, a small note, this feature requires that your code be turned on with debugging symbols activated, right? Uh, which most of the time it is going to be anyway, but you know, just a note. Okay, so finally, okay, so the cache abstraction. This is one of my personal favorite features. It's got so much applica application in, in what a lot of people are doing today that it uh, wouldn't surprise me if it's one of your favorite features as well. Uh, 
as, you, as we talked about earlier, whenever we can, we try and provide useful abstractions on top of otherwise sort of disparate technology surface areas, right? So for example, transaction management is one of those places where Spring provides an immense value by unifying the APIs uh, and providing a common facilitating abstraction, right? Um, another one is caching, right? How many of you have got some sort of pattern in your code where you do some sort of expensive computation, check a resource, if the value comes back, uh, then you s stick it in a cache and then check that cache on all subsequent lookups for that same method, right? It's a very common idiom. We've, I'm sure, done the, the dance a, a zillion different times in our code. Um, but the thing of it is, that's a very common idiom. It, there's no reason you should have to rewrite it each time, just like you shouldn't have to rewrite transaction management. It's something that a lot of us are going to do many, many times per application. It's something that is also uh, imminently suited to uh, uh, aspect-oriented programming. You know, it can be extracted out as an aspect and then applied across all your objects, you know, in a one quick, one clean stroke, right? So the cache manager API and the cache abstraction provide that ability. The idea is that you have the cache manager implementations, and those abstract away knowledge about backing caches like Gemfire, like Redis, like Coherence, like you know, EH cache, etc. Uh, and then you have the cache objects, which you can also get references to, right? And the cache objects are, they represent individual regions in which objects live inside the cache. As I mentioned earlier, uh, this, this is increasingly important nowadays because we're seeing caches being made available as a very common default in different technologies, particularly in the cloud. You're seeing people adopt things like Redis. How many of you guys have heard of Redis? It's a, it's a small little project, very, very you know, quaint. Some very small little websites are starting to use it. How many of you have heard of Stack Overflow? OK, yeah, they're using it, for example. You know, a few billion requests. Not, nothing big, nothing you know, to write mom about or anything. But still, it's getting out there. You know? And so people are starting to use these technologies because they need serious scale. We all know what happens when you push Oracle too hard. You've never seen a more expensive fall in your life. You know? um, so caching is a very, very valuable thing. This is the thing that will save the databases, I think. Um, so OK, so we introduced the caching support in 3.1. Good, awesome. We've already got several diff different implementations that you can use out of the box for each cache and for the Java that you told that maps and for Redis and so on. Other projects like Spring Data Redis provide implementations for, uh, that's the, the Redis pro implementation. The Gemfire implementation comes from, from Spring Data Gemfire. Other projects out there in the, in the open source community uh, also provide implementations. So how many of you are using InfiniSpan from the, the JBoss guys? It's a pretty neat little cache, and uh, they actually have an implementation of the Cache Manager SPI as well, right? There's other, like Hazelcast, I think, has one as well. I mean, there's just a lot of different implementations being provided already by third-party people, right? And additionally, um, Spring is, <laughs> Spring is uh, the first enterprise technology to provide support for JSR 107. Right? So we'll have it, we'll have, once that spec goes final, and once it, it's solid, it'll be supported in Spring 3.2, which should debut long before Java E7, right? So you'll have, a, you'll have the ability to access all these JSR 107 supporting cache implementations, again, <laughs> again with a little bit of chagrin, before the rest of the, uh, the Java E7 stack. So one common use case is, OK, like I, like I just showed you, I showed you one version of a cache that relies on just java.util.map in memory for my testing. But then when I'm in production, I want to delegate to Redis. right? Um, how would you achieve that in a real application? Well, profiles happens to be a great use for that. right? You can specify that this is one definition for one environment and one for another. So here's kind of some examples. right? It's very simple. You say at enable caching in your configuration class, or you use the uh, XML namespace. You say cache colon annotation driven. Um, and you define a cache manager like we did. And then in your, co your domain code, your component code, uh, you can just annotate your methods, right? Annotate your interfaces if you want, but uh, you, you annotate the methods that return idempotent values. So it's, we've all done the factorial example where you memoize the return value of a, com of a computation. So each input is going to be a constant output, so you might as well just cache it and not bother recomputing it each time, right? Um, to use that, to use this annotation for that kind of thing, uh, 
It's pre pretty easy. You can actually do at cacheable. Uh, and then whenever somebody invokes load owner, the result, the owner object, will be cached in the backing cache store that we talked about. They, you know, managed by that cache manager. So if you have EH cache, it'll get stored in EH cache for you. The key will be computed based on the arguments to the method. So you can imagine a common scenario, look up my customer by its ID. Well, once I've looked it up, I don't want to look it up again and again. I want to cache the result. It's probably not going to change. The only time I want to look it up again is when the customer object itself has changed, in which case I want to expire the records, right? So here I've got an ID. That's the key. And then the owner itself is going to be stored in the cache. You can specify conditions. You can use the spring expression language uh, to s conditionally stipulate that certain beans should be used at certain times, right? Or should be cached based on certain conditions. And you can do anything. And this is just kind of a silly example, but the spring expression language is like, um, how, how many of you guys have used the JSF expression language? OK, now imagine if that had support for it, most things you wanted to do. How many of you have used the JSF expression language, but then also said, no, screw it, I need to use the JBoss expression language, because it's got more power? Or I want to use something completely different, like the, like, um, what's that other one that used to be so popular that's in tapestry? Uh, OGNL, you know? More powerful expression language. So the spring expression language is a very large superset of most of those. Uh, it's got a lot of power. So you can actually call methods on, this, on these beans. You can access environment variables. You can access static methods, et cetera. So you can do anything you want in that expression language to make the decision based on whether a bean should be accessed very easy, right? So here's an example of that in this case. Here I'm saying if the argument name has a length that's less than 10 characters, then cache the result. I don't know why that's a useful case, but whatever, you know. Um, otherwise, don't cache it. So you can get really fancy based on the rules. There's no, there's no, it's not either or, right? And of course, the, uh, for every time you put an object in, there's probably some useful scenario where you want to take the object out, right? Like Bill Cosby, I, I, put you, I brought you into this world, I can take you out. So at cache evict, tell Spring that whenever somebody calls this method, you want to delete the corresponding entry in the cache. You want to evict it from the cache. Right, so you've got support for uh, caching and then uncaching. Based on the same rules, by the way, same, same key resolution algorithm. The, the parameters to the method themselves become used in the creation of a key that is, looked, that is used to look up the object and then delete it. Uh, let's see here. I have, in my little example here, da -da -da, services. Very, very sort of simple pedestrian example. I've got a bunch of methods here that return data, right? And I want them stored in the customer's region. Here I'm specifying which region in the cache to use. Because it's just annotations, you can actually use a static private final constant if you want, so you don't have to retype that in each time. In this case, the region itself is just a string customers. So if you don't specify the region, um, you, know, you need to specify a region, basically. It's more useful, and this is a good way to do it. Instead of re repeating the string each time, um, so you can see I've got customer get customer by ID. I specify the key as the ID, and then I'm storing the result. I've got cache evict on my delete customer method, right? And same thing for cache evict. I've got the uh, update customers method here, but here I've got a special case. Here I've got multiple parameters. And I only want the first one to be consulted. Because remember, before, I stored the objects by key based on its ID. Well, when, the spring, when spring sees the update customer method, it's going to create the key based on ID, first name, last name, and the birthday, which I don't want. That would be, there's no value in the cache that matches that, that, uh, that composite, right? So you can specify that spring should only consult the first parameter, the ID parameter. Right? So you can actually get, you can get very, very fine-grained control over which parameters are used in creating the composite key and so on. Any questions on that before I continue? OK. Uh, so another big part of the, the uh, Spring 3.1 release was the support for Servlet 3.0, the initial support for Servlet 3.0. The rest, some of the uh, more exotic support that most people aren't using anyway yet, uh, will be available in Spring 3.2. And there's already early access releases now that you can get. If you look at the uh, blog.springsource.org, you can see people talking about the new features in Spring 3.2 and the Spring MVC support for asynchronous processing in Spring 3.2 already. 
So show of hands, how many of you guys are using Tomcat? Something like it. OK, cool. Tomcat 6? Crickets. 7? Yay, OK. Um, how many of you guys are using Glassfish? I just, I just say that to be nice. I, I don't think anybody's using it. But it's always nice to ask. Uh, let's try it again. How many of you guys have met somebody who once knew somebody who once used or maybe looked at or downloaded Glassfish once, even once? If you did it once, that's enough. Anybody? OK. Um, well, I tried. Anyway, the point is that these, these containers have Servlet 3.0 support. 3.0 is actually pretty awesome. I mean, the Servlet 3 stuff is looking really good, you know? It codifies a lot of the stuff that was previously baked as, as sort of extensions to these containers, you know, out of band extension that you could use if you wanted to, but they weren't part of the Servlet container themselves by default. Certainly not part of any spec. And uh, we've embraced those features wherever possible. So one big part of that is set up for uh, uh, XML free web apps, right? How many of you, I mean, you guys are doing web programming with Java, I imagine? Show of hands, yeah. So you've done a web.xml or two or 10 or 1,000. Um, web.xml itself is sort of this, I mean, the specs make you use XML a lot, you know, and Spring has always been about choice. So uh, it's nice to see them finally embracing that. The Servlet 3.0 stuff doesn't require you to use web.xml, right? Uh, and so we've embraced that. We actually provide support for using completely Java-centric, completely uh, uh, XML-free web applications. The idea is that you register a component that implements the servlet container. Uh, it works with Spring support for the servlet container initializer SPI, right, in servlet 3.0. And whenever Spring sees these beans, it'll launch them, and then it gives you a callback and a pointer to the, to the uh, servlet context. And then from there, you can programmatically register servlets and filters and all that stuff, just like you would with web.xml, but it's in Java code. So you have the same ability as you did before to programmatically build this kind of stuff, you know? Um, let's look at that, actually. So this is Spring Application Context Initializer. Now, oh. in this example, oh, because this is supposed to run on uh, here, let's go a different one, github.com. Java config, let's see if that has it. There we go. That's what I was looking for. So uh, here's an, a very simple, uh, completely XML-free sort of a web application built on Spring 3.1 and using Server 3.0 and all that stuff. So again, if you looked at a lot of what we've done so far, we created a Hibernate. We set up Hibernate earlier. Hibernate had no XML at all, right? We set up just completely in Java. We're setting up a web application here. Again, no XML at all. Um, we could have used JPA. We wouldn't have required XML. Um, and basically, Spring through one is the only enterprise technology that lets you completely avoid XML if you want to. You know, uh, it's got a very, it's, it's very, very easy to write clean applications quickly. Where did I put it? Mm. Can't find a good reference to it. Okay. Anyway, bless you. Uh, I'll find a good example, but basically it's, you can write web.xml free versions of your Spring applications, no problem at all. It's very easy. Uh, we also have support for, serv I mean, in Servlet 3.0 we've, what's up? Was that available in 3 .1? Yeah, this is all 3.1 um, as well, right? Uh, in Servlet 3.0 we've exposed, we, we support now, whenever possible, the, f the file upload support, the part API, the servlet.part multi-part uh, APIs inside of Servlet 3.0. Basically, how many of you guys have used Commons file upload? Yeah, OK, it's an old standby, right? Spring is very smart. When, when Spring MVC gets started up, when you have the at enable WebMVC, Spring starts up and it detects the presence of Commons file upload 
on the class path. And if it's there, then you can automatically submit um, form data with files in it to a Spring MVC uh, controller. And the controller will accept it as a parameter and it'll automatically marshal it for an object that you can get access to, right? Like a multi-part MIME object, whatever. Uh, and you can pick, it, pick that object apart and get the file name and get the input stream and all that stuff. Well, now, if it detects Servlet 3.0 file upload support, it'll also support it there. And you don't need Commons file upload anymore, right? So in both cases, it's to you. If you just have the support available, it's just transparent. Your file uploads will automatically work. You can create your controllers with you know, all that stuff, no problem. Oh, here we go. Here's the web, app, web application initializer that I was trying to show you guys earlier. If you create a class like this and put it in your class path somewhere, Spring will detect it when Spring starts up. And then it'll, it'll give you a callback. And you can actually create the annotation config web application context, set the packages to scan, register configuration classes, and then register that as a listener. Right. So here we've got the context loader listener. You could also register serverlet context dot Add dispatcher servlet. You know, you can add, you can add a servlet. You can add the Spring filters and so on, right? All from Java. So this is in lieu of instead of web.xml. Okay, so completely XML free. Um, in Spring MVC, we've also added support for things like the Flash scope, and we've also uh, very very extensively sort of reworked the internals of Spring MVC. Some of the stuff you won't care about for the very large 80%, 90% case, right? Um, but we've also made it so that you can plug in different types of behavior based on the return values of controller methods and based on the arguments of those controller methods. So how many of you are using Spring MVC? OK, yeah. So if you're using Spring MVC, are you using the annotation-centric stuff, where you have the annotations, you say, at request mapping and so on? <clears throat> those, the return values of those methods uh, used to be kind of a it was baked in what, what happened based on the return value, and only the Spring framework itself could extend that. Now there's an SPI, so if you want to handle the return type of a, of a controller method in a different way that the framework, than the framework already provides, this is your hook. Same thing for the parameters, right? So it's, it's just about extensibility. You probably won't, won't need it, but it's nice to know it's there. Um, and then we've also added support for the flash map stuff. Flash map is kind of a common case. How many, you, know, you submit something to a form. You want to do something with the results, and you need to keep the value acro across the redirect, right? It's very common where you, you do a submit, you get a value, and then you redirect to some other resource. So that way, if they hit the back button, it won't resubmit the form, right? But you want that data to persist beyond the redirect. Well, by default, that doesn't happen, right? By default, Spring MVC and everything else, basically, forgets about that data once you've done a redirect. The context is lost. So a common pattern is to stick that in the session and then redirect and then pluck it out of the session once you're on that, on that redirected page. That's called a flash scope, right? You want something to live just once. One, you want it to live for one redirect and no longer. And that has become, we've added support for that as a, just a regular scope now. So you can say that this value will live during post and then it'll also survive the redirect. We've added support, we saw this earlier, we've added support for uh, Persistence.xml free uh, JPA, right? So you can use JPA 2 and you can use Hibernate 4 and 3, so, you know, as appropriate, uh, and create nice, clean, Java centric versions of these APIs if you want to work with them. Uh, we've also made it easy to set up JPA itself without the persistence.xml, and you can take full advantage of all these different uh, new features in JPA 2. Um, <laughs> Hibernate 4. Hibernate 4.1, I think, is like the current one. Maybe it's 4.2 now. But basically, Spring. 3.1 shipped all of like three days. We were tracking Hibernate 4 during its gestation. And as soon as it was GA, we were ready to go GA because we, we had tracked it. So uh, this is the first easy way to use Hibernate. You know? We've also updated the Quartz API. How many of you guys are using job scheduling systems like Quartz or BMC or Autosys or Cron or something? Um, those are great. But Spring has, for the last three and a half years, had a very nice integration in the core framework itself, where you just say at scheduled, and then you provide a cron expression or an interval or a fixed rate, and it'll automatically run that code on a, you know, periodically for you. But if you want to use Quartz 2.0, then there's now support for that in Spring Core as well that mirrors. It looks very similar to the support we've always had for 1.4, right? Uh, I mentioned Java SE7. Again, it's not required. 
But if it's there, we try and make the best use of it. We try and take advantage of it. So for example, the fork join fr framework, which can be very useful for some very different kinds of computations, computations that are basically, if they, if they can be done in Lisp using MapReduce, they could probably be done in the fork join framework inside of Java SE 7. It's very nice, very natural. And there's now a task executor integration on top of that. The, the Spring thread pool SPI is ma mapped to that nicely. Uh, we take advantage of JDBC 4.1 if it's available in our, in our code. Um, 3.2 is on its way. You can already see release candidates and stuff like that sort of trickling out and people talking about the new features. Uh, in general, 3.1 is a nice arrangement of technologies. A lot of the ideas that were started in 3.0 kind of find their completion in 3.1. If you're looking at, if you're on 2.5x and you're looking to upgrade, skip 3.0, just go straight to 3.1. Uh, it is a drop-in replacement as always. Um, you know, and 3.2 will be even cooler. Thanks, guys.